recognizing and undoing racism. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I admire you all for being here for day three of our conference and for being here at 9.15. Uh, we have an important discussion uh, that I think grows out of our wonderful session last year in Dallas about recognizing and undoing racism. And at the opening session, I uh, did a modified land acknowledgement based on the model of our great Canadian colleagues who acknowledge the historic ownership of land. Uh, I want to extend that to uh, a moment of racism acknowledgement as, as we seek to serve communities and to invite them into our world of opera. I think we have to do more acknowledgement of the history of the place than we have done heretofore. So I um, did a little bit of research and just have a couple of things to read. Racially segregated schools that operated secretly and illegally in St. Louis since the 1820s. But in 1864, an integrated group of St. Louisans formed the Board of Education for Colored Schools, which established schools without public finances for more than 1,500 black pupils in 1865. After 1865, the St. Louis Board of Education appropriated funding for the black schools, but facilities and conditions were quite poor. In 1875, after considerable effort and protest from the black community, high school classes began to be offered at Sumner High School, the first high school for black students west of the Mississippi. However, inequality remained rampant in St. Louis schools. The St. Louis black community was relatively concentrated along the riverfront or near the railroad yard. White flight began in earnest during the late 1950s and continued during the 1960s and 70s. From 1950 to 60, the city population declined by 13%. From 1960 to 70, the city declined another 17%. Between 1960 and 1970, a net 34% of white city residents moved out. Although formal segregation in St. Louis public schools ended in 1965 after the Broad versus, um, uh, Brown versus Board of Education case, St. Louis area educators continued to employ tactics to ensure de facto segregation during the 1960s. In the 1970s, a lawsuit challenging this segregation led to a 1983 settlement agreement in which St. Louis County school districts agreed to accept black students from the city on a voluntary basis. Under a renewed agreement in 1999, the agreement allowed districts to reduce the number of incoming transfer students starting in 2002. In addition, districts have been permitted to reduce available seats in the program. Since 1999, districts have reduced availability by 5% annually. So that's some racism affirmation. I was motivated to uh, schedule and plan this session. Uh, frankly, two and a half years ago, I was driving in a car from Richmond, Virginia to Washington, D.C., and there was a national public radio essay, uh, This American Life, that documented the history of the Normandy school system where Ferguson High School is located. And it talked about the certification, decertification, recertification of Normandy schools, which are seen to be profoundly underperforming. And at the time that the schools reopened, there weren't enough teachers and students sat in classrooms without teachers for hours in their day. And I had left Richmond in the middle of a morning and noticed some um, young black boy teenagers just walking around the streets wondering why they weren't in school. And then I listened to this NPR story driving in the car and I realized how profoundly we had contributed to the conditions that would have these young black fellows walking on the streets in downtown Richmond. And I felt it was really, really important, since we are here so close to the Normandy school system, to Ferguson, where Opera Theater of St. Louis has played a role in some of the healing that's required, that we take a real look at it and talk among ourselves about recognizing and undoing racism. 
So I have enlisted my great good friend, Roberto Bedoya, to lead our panel discussion today, which is uh, distinguished beyond any description. Roberto, let me turn it over to you. Thank you. <laughs> Basically, he calls me up. Mark calls me up and says, Bedoya, I have a problem. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really know what, how to proceed, but Mark really knows everything about <laughs> how to proceed. Uh, but I'm trying to make a joke about the fact that uh, he, his, I appreciate his leadership greatly. I appreciate the fact that Opera America has, uh, as a network of, of opera um, leaders that you guys are, have really decided that they want to take a deep dive and look at like how racism works. Uh, this panel of educators and arts leaders is I'm honored to be a part of. So maybe I'll just immediately go into my first question. Uh, as it relates to trauma and racism, and how, especially, I'll start with you, Melanie, because you sort of, and, the edu and Mark, you guys both work in the field of education. Then we'll go maybe this way. Uh, how that racism as a form of trauma is manifested and embodied in the systems that you guys work in. So just some, and then how do you sort of um, see it and, and, and the remedies that you are thinking about? OK, okay take a sip of coffee. <laughs> go, go for it. Right. Um, so I'll, I'll start just a little bit on that, OK? Uh, my name, again, is Melanie Powell Robinson. And one of the things that I wanted to share all, with you all today is a little bit of history where I worked with Riverview Garden School Districts in crisis communication for about six years at one point in time. Um, and that six years, we were able to work with both Ferguson Florissant School District and Normandy School District uh, very, very closely. So I'm very much understanding what was going on with regards to a lot of things. So just really briefly, let me kind of give you a little history um, maybe the last 10 or so years in those particular North County school districts and what has happened from a, a racial or a segregation area. In 2010, a smaller district called Wellston was absorbed by Normandy School District. So Wellston was underperforming by state standards. It was very small. It was in a North County area. It had very few students, and the State uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education went to Normandy School District and said, can you take the students? Normandy School District said yes. By 2013, because of some legal um, court issues with regards to a case brought against the St. Louis public school system for being unaccredited at the time, a transfer law was upheld. And that then went into effect in 2013. What that law did was that allowed anyone in an unaccredited school system to then transfer to an outside school district which was accredited. Any of the school districts that were accredited were able to charge whatever tuition that they had established. The school districts, which at the time were unaccredited, Riverview Garden School District and Normandy, had to pay the tuition requested. Unlike uh, what Mark was talking about with regards to St. Louis Public Schools and the county school systems, there was not an agreement of a tuition. Okay, so in St. Louis Public Schools, if a student transferred to a county school, there was a standard fee, somewhere around $7,300 for the city student to go to a county school district. That did not happen with Normandy. That did not happen with Riverview Garden School District. So some of our affluent school districts charged up to $23,000 per child. That money left Normandy and Riverview Garden School Districts. We were dealing with that in 2013. 
and trying to build community within the school systems and gain accreditation. And we received a call shortly before school was to begin that a young man had died in the Riverview Garden School District. We then dealt with, for a full year, both Normandy, where Michael Brown had recently graduated, and Riverview Garden School District, and Ferguson School District, with everything that followed from there. So when we talk about trauma, and we start talking about what's happening with students that are attending schools, with all of this particular history, we also have to think about what kind of trauma their parents and the community um, and society as a whole kind of connect with that. So in Riverview Garden School District, shortly after the Mike Brown um, death, and all the way up until the Stockley verdict, the school systems, Riverview Gardens, along with Normandy and Ferguson Florissen School District, had to bring in a lot of people, a lot of counselors, to talk through not just what was going on at that moment and the trauma that we saw on play every single day in the media, but also many years of what it meant to feel separated and segregated from a larger society. Go ahead, Mark, because you're an education field of education as well. So, at the Biome School, um, we are we're a K through five school. Uh, we're a K through five public charter school. And we have, uh, this past year, we had 130 students, uh, of which 85% are African American, and 76% of our student body is at or below the poverty line. And so what, what we see along the lines of, of uh, trauma is really a lack of access to uh, what many of us take for granted, things like being read to uh, as an infant and understanding how to spell your name when you enter kindergarten or first grade um, and understanding the difference between letters and numbers. So we take all these things for granted, right? These are normal things. I read to my son every night. He's going to know how to read when he enters school. But our kids are coming to us without these tools. And when, when you talk about trauma, the trauma is there and it's going to exist uh, for a long time. It will be there well after I'm gone. But if we don't give uh, our kids, and it's not just black kids, either that we're seeing, it, it's poor people. Mm -hmm. People that don't have access to education. If we don't give them the tools to actually combat that trauma and to rise above that trauma, we're gonna see the same cycles over and over again. Um, at our school, we put a lot of emphasis on a holistic approach. And our first year, we had a great curriculum and the kids came in and we thought, oh, this, this is gonna be fantastic. They're going to learn about engineering and art and mathematics and no. They were not ready because they didn't, some of them didn't know their real names. They actually didn't know their real names. They thought their names were was Nene and her name was not Nene. So that's, that's what we're dealing with. So we had to rethink our approach and we really had to bring in uh, a, a full-time counselor a full-time reading specialist to help our kids catch up, and also occupational therapy, all of these things that we, once again, us who are well off, we take these things for granted, but these kids, they have nothing. And their parents, at some, sometimes they don't know better because they don't know these things exist. They don't know their kids have problems with speech. They don't know their kids have issues with holding pencils, things like that, that can really hold a child back. And and the scary thing is, if, if a child is not reading at grade level by grade three, they are not reading grade level by grade three across the board, they are one out of eight uh, is likely not to graduate from high school. If you're African American, four out of eight. And this is a scary stat, but 75% of the juveniles that interface with the court system are functionally illiterate. So the world becomes your enemy in the third grade when you cannot read. So th these kids are not even getting to the starting line. They're done, and at, at third grade, they're done. And so we've got to do something about this. And we're trying to do our small part at the Biome School, but we've got to change our approach to education and start giving people tools to rise above the trauma. I, 
I think that we, pivot, we started off this conversation with trauma and we will continue it, but I just want to make clear that racism is a form of trauma. And so not, and so when you're in the field of education that you're talking about, the traumatized body um, is also, can fall victim to kind of the prison industrial complex mechanisms and that I'll end up, you know, why a high number of incarceration of people of color. But uh, I just, in that same context of the trauma and the traumatized body and racism, Felicia, you work in a public art agency. How do you see those, that, that, that trauma being played out in your, in your, your ecosystem? Then we'll have the opera people talk. <laughs> <laughs> The Regional Arts Commission is a quasi-public public, uh, funding agency. We've been around since 1985. And I, I would say for the past 30 or so years, our approach to uh, philanthropy has been fairly traditional, uh, fairly transactional, I should say. Um, you do great work, we fund you. That's the, that is the, the uh, transaction between us. And so as we look at this disconnect that we have in our community, in our ecosystem, where we're funding uh, traditional anchor institutions uh, like the opera, like the symphony, ballet companies, theater companies, who are accustomed to uh, working with communities that are resourced, um, that are able to uh, accept uh, the gift of the arts, that now we are seeing are at such a basic level of existence, the idea of uh, the arts coming in and taking up a part of your school day is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, we're dealing with some very basic, basic needs. And so what we're seeing in terms of trauma is how do we catch up? How do we now um, help our organizations through our, our arts giving uh, become more relevant to the real needs of the community? Uh, we're dealing with the issues of distrust in communities uh, where they believe that they have been so marginalized, uh, so underrepresented, that they don't see themselves. And so how do we level the playing field through philanthropy? How do we say, um, well, we're not going to um, defund organizations that aren't relevant, but certainly we need to uh, fund you differently. And so what that requires is, are two things, intentionality and leadership. And so when the Regional Arts Commission decided to enter into uh, a really deep discussion with the people of St. Louis through a, a cultural visioning process, uh, we formed a, 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 an advisory committee of people to, uh, called the Thought Leaders Forum to talk about what's really happening in St. Louis and, and some of the members of, of that uh, uh, committee, um, like Timothy, uh, could actually say, and he'll probably get in trouble for this, you know, it is time, it is it's beyond time that we level the playing field. And organizations like uh, uh, the symphony and the opera are going to have to accept that in order for us to catch up and reinvest in the communities that have been so marginalized, we're gonna have to accept maybe not less, but different very different, and, and, and that really touched me because nobody wants to receive less money, nobody. No one's gonna willingly say, hey, give me less money. <laughs> but seriously, that's what it takes. It takes leadership and a great deal of intentionality to begin to address the disparities that exist in our community through philanthropy. Uh, last night I saw a really wonderful, uh, the opera, American Soldier at, uh, at Timothy's opera company, it was really great. It's lingering in a really wonderful way for me. But in a way, uh, speaking about trauma, that was an, an opera about trauma. And it was also an opera about racism. Can you talk about, a little bit about how that came to be and how that experience of producing this opera kind of is linked to your, 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 your charge your desire to look at racism in, in our civil life? Uh, thank you, Roberto. And um, 
Let me just say thank you to everybody on this panel for being here for your Saturday morning. Uh, and uh, yeah, I have so much to say. I'll try to be brief. The, so uh, producing an American soldier for us is just a part of what we call our New Works Bold Voices series, which the, the focus of it is to uh, present new American works uh, that embrace a diversity of cultural and musical influences by living American composers and that speak to the uh, topics that are most top of mind for contemporary audiences. So um, it, it actually, like a lot of things, it began with a relationship with an artist. Our artistic director, James Robinson, had directed another opera by Huang Ro, the composer, and, uh, and said to me, we have got to do something of Huang Ro's. And so we, we talked and talked and talked with Huang Ro about possible uh, operas that we would commission. And then none of the ideas really felt like they were uh, the, the sort of center of what we wanted to be presenting. And then uh, Jim and Huang Ro realized that there was this opportunity because there was this opera, An American Soldier, that had had a, um, a, a commission and a premiere as a one-act short opera by the Washington National Opera. Uh, and it had been uh, well received, but it had been underdeveloped at the time. Uh, and I will say it was a decision point because we had had up till then a sort of an unwritten policy that yes, we would deal with topics that were uh, very resonant with our current times, but generally with at least a 20 year distance. When we did uh, you know, the, the death of Klinghoffer, uh, we were now uh, decades away from the event that had occurred. Uh, and in this case, the, the, the events in An American Soldier took place in 2011. Uh, so this is an incredibly recent event for an opera company to be producing a, a, an artistic work about. Uh, and that, of course, totally changes the level of responsibility and, uh, and, uh, and immediacy that the, the, the work takes on. Uh, so I guess, yes, a conscious choice to confront something that was very uh, necessary for us to deal with in our uh, culture. I think in St. Louis, because of all the history that we're talking about, uh, art that, uh, that directly confronts issues of racism uh, is important for us to be presenting. Uh, and you know, I, what I think the arts allow us to do, I hope, is that through very specific stories, we deal with very big topics. And uh, that's, that's the thing that we can bring, is uh, you know, if it's the character of Leon Klinghoffer or the, the character of Danny Chan, I'm, I'm using the word character. I'm, of course, speaking about real people who become characters in artistic works. Through the, through the identification with a character, uh, audiences and hopefully communities beyond the audiences who actually attend uh, become, uh, we hope, transformed. So this is our this is our role that we're able to play. Uh, let, let me just say briefly that um, I mean, it, it, St. Louis has been going through a transformative time since the death of Michael Brown uh, and everything that that brought to the surface. That's true of our whole country. But in St. Louis, it has been a, a very, uh, very difficult but very uh, wonderful time to be a part of. I, I had just finished, I've lived in St. Louis now for 10 years. I just finished falling deeply in love with St. Louis as a community uh, after being here for, I guess, seven years when uh, Michael Brown was killed. And, uh, and just to say briefly about trauma. Uh, it, it was like, uh, I don't know, centuries of trauma had uh, surfaced in a new way. And uh, do you all know about Brene Brown, who gives those TED Talks about shame? Mm -hmm. uh, there was something that I really observed, which was, and, and let me say this, I, I love St. Louis as a community. I've come to absolutely love it. But a, a thing that I observed was a, a, a level of shame about the situation that existed that prevented people from dealing with, acknowledging, uh, people would shut down when the subject came up. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what has happened here, and I think elsewhere, is that sustained activism has, uh, has undone our ability to shut down and to avoid and to uh, sort of continue. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and so actually, I mean, we're fortunate to have Felicia Shaw leading the Regional Arts Commission, native St. Louis, and who moved back here because in part, <laughs> <laughs> but in part because of those events, right? You, yes. you, you were motivated to come back and. Absolutely. I mean, it, I was in San Diego, California, sitting at my computer when my Twitter feed kept blowing up about the, the civil unrest, which happened 20 minutes from the house I grew up in. And at that moment, I said, and I'm sure other people said the same things, I need to go back. I was angry, uh, sad, and ashamed all at the same time. Because the things that drove me from St. Louis 35 years ago were still happening. Still happening. Yeah, well, uh, Roberto, go I, ahead. I, I have two questions. One, one is for Mark. Um, in talking about the systemic racism through the educational lens. Um, the, the risk there is that we are talking about you know, children, what happens to young people, and it's profound and traumatic. Um, I, I want to turn to Mark Kent, because we were in Madrid together. And Mark expressed to me his relaxation about being in Madrid. And it didn't have to do with sangria. Um, <laughs> Mark, would you share with me what you spoke about? Yeah, so um, for those of you who know me, I like to shop, right? So, um, so I spent a lot of time in, in Madrid shopping. And um, I was walking around one day. I had a hoodie on, and I was, listening, I was listening to my music, and I walked into a shop and I kept my hoodie on, which I never do in the States. I always take my hoodie off because I don't want anyone to think, you know, maybe this guy is up to no good. So my hoodie's on, and I'm purchasing um, some scarves, like eight of them, <laughs> so, <laughs> which is kind of embarrassing. And I got into a lot of trouble uh, with my wife when I got home. Uh, <laughs> but as I reached for my wallet, there was something missing. It wasn't my wallet, but it was the anxiety wow. that I usually have thinking, what if someone mistakes my wallet for a gun? And I knew that wasn't going to happen there because I was a bit anonymous. And so um, just trying to, just I spent the day trying to wrap my head around that, hmm. of, of all of this, this uh, both, both conscious and also unconscious anxiety that African American men and women carry around on a daily basis, and it becomes the norm for us. And in saying that, I, I don't want sympathy from anyone. Don't want anyone to say, oh, I'm so sorry that that happened to you. It, that, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, because my life, although that took place, my life is still a very beautiful thing. I have many things to be grateful for. And that is a small portion of my life. But we still need to recognize and empathize and look at ourselves. And I'm, I, and I'm speaking to myself as well, because I'm also biased. So I have to check myself constantly. Uh, in my neighborhood, I see African-American young men dressed a certain way. I think, are they up to no good? And I have to check myself. Mm -hmm. And I'm being honest here. I have to check mm -hmm. myself and say, no, you know, Mark, that's, that's wrong. That's wrong. Mm -hmm. And so whenever someone tells me that they're colorblind, I think, you should get to the ER, you're having a stroke. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, it's, it's just impossible. So we're not looking for sympathy. I'm not looking for sympathy, but looking for understanding and hoping that people will recognize that, I'm not, and I don't want to say every, everyone is racist. I don't want to get into that, but bias. We're all biased in some way, shape, form, or fashion. And we need to constantly check, internally check, are my actions offending someone? Whether you're black, white, no matter what you are, you've got to constantly check and reflect on that. And that's just my message here. That's a, that's a really wonderful story. Um, I often think about how the background will determine the foreground. Mm -hmm. And I, if I walk into a room and I'm the only brown person there, I know if everybody's white, that background says, I'm brown, you know? And I need to sort of be mindful of that. And it forces a different voice of mine to come out. Mm -hmm. 
But I want to talk about understanding the little bit that you mentioned and biases. And there's a question for Mark. As the director of Opera America, and you have this wonderful gift of being able to understand what's going on across the country in the field, you've pivoted and created a great group called the Civic Action Group, which is sort of opera companies very committed to looking at sort of the contested issues in their particular cities. Uh, how do you understand and deal with the fact that opera as a field comes off as the definition of whiteness? Oh, um, <clears throat> people hear me say this a lot, and... and I mean, it's perceived. I mean, I'm yeah. not saying, you know... Oh, but you know, it, it is... You know, our business model is based on the um, of exploiting the visibility of rich white people. So if we look at performance programs, newsletters, the gala coverage in the newspaper, um, our business model is, still depends on um, the desire of some wealthy white people to have visibility. And I, I don't know of any opera company that doesn't exploit that business model to a greater or lesser degree. <clears throat> I will commend opera theater for the lesser degree end of that spectrum. So um, we lament our um, stereotypic image and reinforce it frequently. So it's, it's a concern. And a lot of our companies um, will do work that they imagine to be relevant to their communities, and when they have chosen the repertoire, they will ring the bell, uh, the doorbell of the black church or the Hispanic cultural center and seek a short-term relationship they want to define as mutually beneficial, but as really short-term exploitation for purposes of ticket sales. And what I've learned from you, Roberto, um, Roberto speaks in near poetry at our civic <laughs> action group, is that the work has to grow from the relationship. Mm -hmm. And what our civic practice work and our new grants will support is building relationships so that together our communities and we can co-create programming that has value for all. So that underlies our civic practice work. And hopefully that work well done will um, result in a deconstruction of the negative stereotype because that comes from an organic new reality rather than just a suppression of photographs at the beginning of the performance program. When I was invited, Mark invited me to speak uh, at the conference in Washington, D.C. three years ago, I think it was, about belonging and disbelonging and how it operates in, in the field arts field, it's specifically about this notion of creative place making and, and that whole sort of uh, focus on uh, cities in a way. And Felicia and I talked about this, that one of the challenges of the field of creative place making is that it hasn't figured out whether it's about property rights or human rights uh, as a field of practice. And for people of color, often the trauma of American racism, we're still seen as property that people want to manage and that they don't see us as humans. I mean, often, I mean, I just think that gets played out in public policy and cultural policies. Uh, so that's a funny little story to, to get us to this point about the strategies of belonging. Uh, uh, and that one of the, uh, in Oakland, where I work, uh, we just did a cultural plan, and it's called Belonging in Oakland. And I see belonging as this metaphor that helps us remedy um, this, the experiences of racism and kind of opens the door to look at structural racism um, and how it operates in the various systems. So I guess my, my question is like, what are your strategies of belonging in the work that you do, and how does that rub up against the experiences of racism? Mark, I'm gonna go right to you, because you're looking at me. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, 
So my strategies for belonging, um, it's, I think it's really twofold. Um, one is to, first I, I have to recognize that I am extremely privileged. Um, I grew up in a strong two-family household. We didn't have a lot of money, but what my parents lacked in money, they, they gave us richness and character. And so that has allowed me and my siblings to really, you know, rise above and, and you know, become solidly middle class, upper middle class. So I'm extremely privileged and I, can, I completely get it. Um, sometimes um, I feel when I'm, when I find myself in a the theater, I find myself in a movie and I'm watching black characters, oftentimes the subject is about suffering. And sometimes I feel as though that uh, there's some exploitation going on there. There's some suffrage porn mm -hmm. uh, there. Right. And, and, and I said that because I wanted you guys to feel a little bit uncomfortable because that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And I, I, think, I think white audiences sometimes are comfort, they're comforted by the stories, you know, three decades ago, four decades ago, when there was this very apparent struggle there, there's a right side and there's a wrong side, and now we're all on the right side. Right. It's not necessarily true. It's not, it, it actually, it's not true. It's not true. So there needs to be a balance in that. And I hope I'm answering your question here. But there needs to be a balance of, yes, there is suffering, but there's also beauty. Now, I just saw a Black Panther like three weeks ago. Shame on me, right? <laughs> <laughs> Very late to the party. but. I was proud, like I, I, was, I was so proud because I, I saw these images of people of color uh, and they got the royal treatment. I felt like I was watching Lord of the Rings and I'd never seen that before. Most of the images uh, that I've seen, um, it's dealing with violence, it's dealing with uh, extreme poverty and sometimes I personally would love to see more stories that where characters happen to be of color and they are influenced by their backgrounds and their culture and their race. But it's a story that everyone can, um, can identify with because it's a story of love, it's a story of beauty. I, I would like to see more of that because I, you know, I see the suffering every day. I know it's there, you know, we all see it. So why not show the other side? Like I said before, although I deal with racism on a daily basis and there's nothing unique about that, um, my life is awesome. It is awesome. It is beautiful. And I have, I have tremendous moments of beauty, and I would like to see more of that. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd like to weigh in on this notion of belonging um, because I think belonging comes out of a sense of self determination. And I think, uh, particularly you in, in Oakland, where housing prices have skyrocketed and gentrification is such a bad word. Here in St. Louis, you know, we'd be happy to have a little gentrification in a couple of neighborhoods, you know, because, <laughs> because our population has decreased and uh, we really need the density. But this sense of belonging can be translated so well in places like uh, Detroit and, you know, Cleveland and the Pittsburghs that are trying to renew by enabling artists and small community grassroots organizations to self-determine their futures, to own things. I mean, can you imagine the notion of artists owning their homes so that they have a greater opportunity not to be displaced? Because that's where you get a sense of, I belong here, I own something, you can't move me easily. Now you can, you know, uh, through, through laws, you can move people, but uh, once people feel like they have a stake in the ground, they have a piece of land under their feet that they can call their own, then you have power, you have voice, which is why as a funder, this is very practical, I love general operating support. <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> I love unrestricted general operating support. I hate program support, and, and as soon as I can remove it from our portfolio, I'm going to uh -huh. do it. Because when organizations and even individual artists have 
the ability to determine their own future. We have organizations here in, in St. Louis that have been in operation for over 100 years. You would think by now, after 100 years, you can determine how to spend money, <laughs> right? What to buy. Do I need to weigh in on how much toilet paper you should be spending your money on? I think you've gotten it. So this sense of belonging means I, can, I have figured it out. The art is good. That's been proven. Now I need to determine how to uh, build community with the people who care about this work together. And then we know where we're going. Then we can direct our own futures. Melanie, I'm not going to let you be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> and Roberto told me that he wasn't going to. Um, when we start talking about belonging, I feel, uh, coming from Diversity Awareness Partnership, where we do a lot of education and training around microaggressions and unconscious bias, and we recognize that there are a lot of people who um, may not realize that they are being as exclusive as they are. Uh, we start having conversations around images and what media has you know, presented and what you've bought into. And Mark, I thank you for that, saying that the, the images that even you have seen have created a narrative subconsciously now because you've moved it from unconscious to, I know it, but I have to work on it still. Um, and, and then what does that do with regards to how are my steps, my actions going to play off of that sub or unconscious feeling of fear when they see an African-American male um, distance if there's someone that does not look like me in a group. For many African-Americans, especially in fields like opera, we don't see ourselves. Mm -hmm. So that belonging or that sense of belonging is very difficult. I was just sharing with uh, Timothy, that when you are outside of the circle, it is almost impossible to push your way in. The circle has to open up and allow for you to come in. So when we start talking about belonging, I think that there's, there's really work that needs to be done systematically from the bottom up, top down, um, to really address some of the things that are keeping marginalized groups from not feeling welcome. Yes, Mark. It, it's something, that you introduced to me this concept of belonging that has resonated for the last several years very powerfully for me. And in my formulation, I talk about inviting people to feel they belong in our art form, in our theater, and I even talk about belonging in our row. And I travel all over the country and see opera in lots of communities, and I'm you know, frequently um, afforded you know, a good ticket in the middle of the orchestra. And when I arrive, I, as a middle-aged white man, feel myself looked, I'm, people look at me up and down because I'm a newcomer to the prime seating area of the theater. Huh. And here I am with standing in the field as a middle-aged white man, and I don't feel I belong. Huh. And I project that to others who don't have my standing or my color, and I realize what, it, what courage it must take to walk into a space that um, in so many unspoken ways makes you feel that you don't belong. Uh, when I, you talk about belonging, I, I, I <clears throat> often want to make sure that I have clarity about there's the psychology of belonging and there's the sociology of belonging. And it, they, they coexist. So I can feel I don't disbelong. I mean, I can feel uncomfortable. That's my psychology. But then there are certain sort of systems in place that other people and othering and looking at how that the sociology of disbelonging operates in, in, in all of our social systems is something that just makes me the activist that I like to be. But I'm going to pivot a little bit to Timothy, and again, to, just to hear your thoughts to this thing I'm going to give you. What are the aesthetics of belonging? <laughs> the aesthetics of belonging, hang on. <coughs> <laughs> Makes me cough. <laughs> there you go. 
Let me, I'll, I'll see if I can get to that by starting this way. Um, I guess I think that uh, I've thought a lot about the, the whole hierarchy of human need idea and that the idea of belonging is, is our most important need, right? We are social creatures. Our success as a species is based on uh, belonging to units, families, and then communities and working together. That's how we evolved uh, to, to be all over the whole planet. And that uh, storytelling, uh, art making, is one of the most ancient, probably the most ancient way that we have communicated our sense of belonging. Uh, so every, every human group all over the world has this in common, that we, uh, we, we tell stories and communicate through those stories who we are. Uh, and actually, I've been very grateful uh, to Felicia, this Thought Leaders Forum that she described that the Regional Arts Commission put together was this incredible group of arts, only a few arts leaders. It was yeah. mostly corporate, civic, political, educational you know, uh, leaders, all convened by the Regional Arts Commission to think uh, collectively about, well, if the arts were to play a, a truly important role in St. Louis, mm -hmm. uh, what role could we play? Mm -hmm. And uh, the arts leaders there, of course, we're... We talked about belonging a lot. We did talk about belonging a lot. And, <laughs> and you know, we're, we're there believing, okay, the arts can play a role. And to hear corporate, civic, educational, religious leaders talk about the importance of storytelling and what stories we choose to tell and how the arts can, can influence our whole culture and society through the, the choices of, of stories and what we elevate... This was in, hugely um, it was, inspirational to us. It was amazing to me because the, 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 we talk about aesthetics. What's beautiful? Uh, what do we value? And we have, you know, again, in philanthropy, you are always making judgment calls about, you know, who gets highly rated, who gets the most money, who gets less. What do we value? What's less important? And this whole issue of aesthetics, we try to uh, walk around it as much as we can and get someone else to do the dirty work of, of valuing. But this notion of beauty and you know, what's high and what's low, uh, what are we going to keep and what are we going to discard? What canons are important for us to uh, hold up and invest in over the others? Folk art and traditional art, self-taught, or I have an MFA. We're mm -hmm. constantly trying to figure that out and navigate that road. And it's all now being deconstructed in this new world order mm -hmm. as we figure out these, with the dwindling funds that we have and, and the, 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 the ways that we have decided we're going to judge who stays and who goes. You talk about belonging and the aesthetics of valuing. It really comes down to what do we value? in our American society. Let, I'll, I'll, I'll just see if I can get all the way back to opera companies, wh which is to say, to, uh, Mark, I think the story you just shared was, was really important. And I think one, one of the reasons that we're uh, having this panel is the, the session in Denver last year where Carol McCord, as an African-American woman and an arts leader, described the fact that she's been to the opera three times in her life and felt so deeply uncomfortable all three times mm -hmm. that she didn't want to go back. And that was a very hard thing for the opera conference to hear last year. And so uh, to the point that you made about these spaces being so overwhelmingly traditionally uh, white, uh, this is uh, profoundly important work that, that we've got to figure out how to do uh, in our field. Uh, and one of the uh, historical you know, inheritances here is that this is a this is a specific genre of art making that has grown up over 400 years, that was mostly a Western European mm -hmm. uh, art form. Actually, I'm reading the Hamilton biography now, and of course, you can't read uh, the history of the 18th century without understanding how white supremacy uh, led to all the institutions that we have uh, inherited, including the United States of America. Uh, and uh, and so this is this is the history we've been handed. The, the art form itself has actually done so much to create beauty and meaning uh, that it, it is worth uh, pursuing. But uh, we have to redefine what the group is. So so every group uh, 
has has norms and values and, and a sense of belonging because they adhere to norms and values. Uh, and uh, opera companies have been traditionally white spaces, uh, and, uh, and and we have got to cause ourselves to redefine what our group is. Uh, so that the people causing Mark to feel excluded in a certain row of the theater are just acting according to the, the, what they understand their group to be and, and who is this other. Uh, but we, we have got to make rapid progress. And I'll, I'll tell you, so that the, the experience that many of you had at Opera Theater, dining outside on the lawn, you know, this whole, this, this, we, we love this experience. And w a few years ago, we got very intentional about realizing when new people come to our theater that we've worked so hard to get there, mm -hmm. they come to a lawn full of people who actually don't want them there because that, no, that's my table. I sit, I sit at this table, uh, and uh, and so we've we've had it, it, that that's that's not the people's fault. They love that table. That's that's they come for years. That's how they've defined their owner, their belonging in this group, uh, and so we've had to think strategically about how do we actually physically make room, mm -hmm. let alone psychological room, for people to come and enter. I don't know that we have made that much progress, but we have had a lot of conversations about how can we do that better and better. Mm -hmm. One of the, go ahead, Mark. So as we talk about you know, how does one belong to a group, um, I spent about a year in Zambia. And um, it was really interesting for me because I was going back to the continent of Africa. And people kept saying, Mark, isn't it great to be going home? And, I said, I would say, yeah, yeah, sure, it's great to be going home. And so mm -hmm. I got there, and I quickly realized I was not home. Right. <laughs> it was odd. Um, the, the, the first person I ran across in a cafe is a Zambian guy, and, and, he, and we started chatting. He said, ah, Mazungu. I said, I'm sorry, what does that mean? He said, you're white. You're a white person. Wow. I said, OK, I'm a white person. <laughs> Let's. <laughs> I'm going to try this on. So, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> and uh, and what was really interesting is the the expat community, because I was a Westerner, mm -hmm. uh, they they embraced me, and so we you know so I would go to a lot of parties. There there wasn't much of a nightlife, so you would get invited to these house parties, and the conversations would start and you know, people would start drinking and before you know it, we would get to these conversations and we would start talking, not, not we, they would start talking about Zambians and they would say things like, aren't those Zambians lazy? Hmm. You know, Zambians, they, they just don't work hard enough. They're poor because it's their fault. And I thought, oh, these are the conversations that go on in the US mm -hmm. that I'm never privy to and it was such an odd experience to sit there in the midst of that. And I was completely silent. I just wanted to observe. Mm -hmm. And so that, that sense of belonging, it, it, it really depends on where you are. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel very comfortable walking into any opera house because I'm, I'm a former opera singer, and I just feel really comfortable. Um, but you know, when I was in a wedding in, in Boston, I was there for four days, and I literally saw four black people. I was distraught. I needed to get out of there. I wanted to get out of there because I felt so uncomfortable um, because I didn't see anyone that looked like me. And that's something here that is so hard to change because so much of it is about economics. And your entry into a space is more about the money that's in your pockets than your race. And that's what I'm finding as a fundraiser. And I'm talking a bit too long here. As a fundraiser, I'm finding myself in these social clubs where I'm accepted. Um, and people are saying things like, you know, what, what it's like as far as stocks and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, uh, not really, but yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> because they make assumptions because I'm in these social clubs where it costs fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a year to become a member. And they just assume I'm a member because I'm there. I'm just a guest. And so money, socioeconomics, is a really important part of, uh, of, of, of this race puzzle that as, as we try and deconstruct it, put it back together uh, in a more palatable way. Uh, money, mm -hmm. it's money. OK, I need more money. <laughs> <laughs> we all need more money. Uh, yes, yes. One last question for the table, and then we'll probably open it up for questions to the audience. I don't know if there's microphones out there or not, but uh, because uh, 
when, at the end of the play last, or play, the opera last night, uh, you know, there's this refrain, e pluribus units, out of many, one. And I sat down there and I thought to myself, do I really believe that? And I, I just, for me, I wanted to say, out of many, we. Uh, and we, Pretty not hard. like me and my friends, but that plural we that includes people you don't know. Uh, that one notion is sort of, it, I understand that it was a moment in American in mythology that we wanted to be a nation. And there was a way in which that one, it comes off as a homogeneity, we're all the same. No, we need to understand us as a we. And how do we construct we? How do we create we's? How do you operate in a we? That includes people you don't know. So I'm punting it to Marlene, you go ahead. Marlene, I'm no, excuse Melanie. me, Melanie. Oh. Melanie. Melanie. <laughs> sorry about that. I'm sorry, no, no, no. Uh, uh, my congestion is getting the better of me. So I apologize. But you want to... Just think about you. how do you, in your work, yeah. Talk about a we, construct a we. It's sort of in the same yeah. river as belonging. So finding commonalities, um, it does take work. And a lot of times when we, again, I'll go back to unconscious bias. Unconscious bias really serves a purpose. It allows us not to do work really fast. <clears throat> it lets me see very big, furry, teeth, bear. Bear equals strange. I don't have to go through the steps again, the next time that I see a bear, then I know that I should be frightened of bear. So that unconscious bias allows us not to have to do the work. Mm -hmm. When we start talking about we, that's exactly the opposite of what we as scientific creatures want to do. We have to be uncomfortable, and I think Mark talked a little bit about that, and the other Mark did too. <laughs> um, when we see that we're in a place where we're very, very, very comfortable, I think that's the first sign that maybe something's wrong. Okay. <laughs> when we are perhaps with friends and everybody looks like us and thinks like us and there's no discourse in the conversation, um, that's, I think, when we have to do some really, some very reflective uh, moments. Yesterday I came to the opera, it was wonderful. Um, but I did share that as a single ticket holder, one of the first things that I wanted to do after was to leave because it's work to try to have someone that you don't know invite you into a small circle of conversation um, and become part of the we. We have to be uncomfortable and be okay in that uncomfortability. But I would say that if you realize that you're in a place of privilege for whatever reason, I am in a place of privilege for a lot of things and then not privilege on a lot of areas. But if you are in a place of privilege and you recognize that there is someone that is not, I say, do the work. Open up and allow for your we to even be bigger. Roberto, in, in one, of your, one of our meetings with you, you said that we is not the plural of I. And I'd like to- I, That's not my quote. It's a, a Jewish philosopher named Emmanuel Levinas. Uh, and I think, the, and I love that. I mean, you could put that on my headstone. And, and one, one, for, first of all, I've repeatedly given you full credit for it. And second, <laughs> secondly, <laughs> secondly what, what does it mean to you? What, why is that so important to you? Well, you know, now I'll tell a little bit of my storytelling. Um, just because um, I'll blame mom, you know, uh, because I just think my, my construction of uh, my investment in the arts and culture world is really about, you know, creating social cohesions and understanding that we and the politics of we being a closed system. If me and my friends, me and my friends says, you can't come into this house or this space because you're a brown boy. Uh, I'll say, well, wait a second, I'll just redefine that word. You know, I mean, this is why I always feel, this is my love of, of reframing. So I'll say, okay, fine, 
well, I got my weed too, man. Mm -hmm. And my weed's bigger than your weed. <laughs> <laughs> I can play that game. But I just love that. Um, I love the possibilities that exist in the we, and I love the plural. I mean, you know, because Felicia and I were public funders. You know, I mean, I could have maybe played my cards. I used to work at the Getty. I could have stayed there and been all, like, you know, mm -hmm. Have those cards to come to the table and and really enjoy that privilege, and they were good to me. But I just said, "Hey, man, you know, it's like I got some other work to do." Um, so it, uh, yeah, I, it's a good, it's the open-ended question of my life, buddy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could I Please. make a comment about you know the the chorus "E pluribus unum" in the opera? So that you know, you all know that's our national motto: "Out of many, one." and I will say, we, we've all been struggling with this because our creators, Huang Rowe and David Henry Huang, they put that in there, and, and yet, you know, it's like with the world premiere, you, you put it all together and then you see what you've got. And when we all put, we put it all together, we were like, wow, that chorus, at that moment, it still doesn't feel like it, we have earned the ability to sing that, uh, right? Well, tell and, David to change it. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have a feeling that as we keep working on the opera, right, we might, we might see a, a, a little bit of new connective tissue in there. Uh, and uh, I will say that I, I did a lot of research on the whole origin of this idea. And in the 18th century, uh, the, the many, was all the different groups of white people, right? It was the different religious groups and the different uh, countries of origin from Western Europe. Uh, and at, at that time, those people saw themselves as being as different and alien from one another uh, as, as uh, people of different races, et cetera, do today. Uh, and we, of course, we can't appreciate that that's true anymore. So the, 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 the struggle to create a one out of a many uh, is historic. Uh, we've never achieved it. I, I, I think I do like your reframing of it, because the idea that, that we'll ever actually be one is, uh, is, is probably completely unachievable. Uh, and yet, or maybe the, the, undesirable. M maybe undesirable. And yet, the challenge that we all have is this idea of group cohesion, right? If, if we're going to succeed, if we're going to accomplish things, as a group, we have to find a way to be a single group that feels accountable and responsible to one another. I think that that is the, the profound challenge of our country right now. H how do we get a sense of oneness uh, out of the, the incredible pain of, of separation? But you know what, Timothy, if we could just rally around maybe two or three things. I don't think we have to be on the same page on everything, right. but could we just narrow down to these two issues yeah. we have to be on the same page about. Yeah. I think we'd be better off. And then the rest of it, dance your own dance. <laughs> dance your own dance over there. But on these two, we're a couple. <laughs> Amen. Any questions from the audience? Uh, just, do we have mics? Yes. Oh, cool. So uh, don't be afraid. Yes, sir, right here in the front, way up here. Um, we have a mic coming. Microphone coming. Sorry. Yeah, hi, I'm Mont Levy from St. Louis and had the pleasure to be part of the Thought Leadership Forum. It occurs to me as you talk about this subject, which is profoundly important, this is actually an advanced session because what I've come to see is the language for most people when they think about access is people can't afford a ticket. And this conversation is so far beyond that, this notion of actually belonging. How do we begin to open up people's minds to an understanding that the issue of access, the issue of leading to equity, requires so much more of us? How do we train our trustees? How do we train our patrons? How do we train our volunteers? So I would appreciate thoughts that you all may have. I'm, I'm well, cutting to Mark, because he's <laughs> like, you're the field, man. See, the reason that there's another Mark on the panel is so I can always duck behind the <laughs> name. Oh, you mean that, Mark? You know, you know at Opera America, uh, one of our roles is to bring the discourse 
into the room where we have a general session for an audience that includes patrons and trustees and staff members. So we, we can keep the subject in front of everyone and hopefully have people who can express it in terms that are deeply honest and moving and true. Uh, and then we, through our regional meetings and our civic practice and our magazine and all of that, we try to keep it going. But we do finally delegate to you with hope and optimism that the conversation will here will change the conversation at home. And, and, I, and I'll say that while we want to have these deep conversations, we ultimately have to land on policy. Because without the policy to drive the change, it remains an interesting dinner conversation. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the rubber really hits the road. Um, ultimately, uh, we're going to have to be more transparent about what the decisions we're making around the art, around who, around where, around how much, and then codify it and hardwire it with policy that everyone understands and everyone can get behind, whether, I mean, not necessarily get behind, but sometimes we hate policy, mm -hmm. but that we can defend. Mm -hmm. So that we're not relitigating this issue over and over and over again into the next millennium. We've got to get to it and make sure we're all following the rules, the new rules, the new world order. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a African American man back there, and then, then the front row. Yesterday in this session, one of the things that came up was strategic partnerships, and that is very important. Are you talking about going into your community? It doesn't matter whether it's African American, Hispanic, or whatever. I think. When you do that, that brings some value to the community because what happens when, like I remember Trimonitia and some other things came up, a lot of African Americans came to Opera Theater. But if you want people of color to come, why not go into the community? I, and I think the symphony has done a wonderful job of that mm -hmm. where they have the partnership where they go into the schools and the members of the orchestra will play. And I think when you have that kind of thing in a community, you start developing the relationships. And you have students who have a desire. And I understand some of it's funding like anything else. But I think you have to start from the ground up. I'd like to respond to the issue of partnerships because partnerships, you, you go into it thinking there's a 50-50 partnership. But there's a power struggle going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So depending on how the partnership came together, if it was a funding partnership, what had happened, it has happened in the past is the larger institution would be given the bulk of the money to go mm -hmm. partner with the, mm -hmm. the smaller one. And all of a sudden, uh, the power dynamics aren't what they should be. So I say, if we want to have these partnerships, we need to change the paradigm and perhaps shift the funding to the smaller organization and let them lead the way, because indeed, um, they know best what's happening in, the, in their own communities. And so if it's about outreach to their community, make sure that the power dynamics are what they should be. And I won't even say equal, but they should recognize what happens when you have a larger org institution and a much smaller in institution trying to dance together. Mm -hmm. Roberto gave me uh, Roberto gave me another one of his you know bone mows is that in a a, a a valid partner in a, in a valid partnership both parties are ready to change mm -hmm. and too often the partnerships that are defined by the major institution are partnerships where the major institution hopes that the smaller institution will mm -hmm. change to be more favorably disposed towards the big institution um, but in, in, as a litmus test, if you're entering a partnership with another arts or non-arts organization, are you willing to change as much as you fantasize the others are willing to change? Right. I just want to make sure I get the, the sequence. This woman here and then the gentleman back over there in the flat. So go ahead. Uh, at some point, the microphone will get to you. <laughs> yes. yes yeah. you. <laughs> Uh, Diane McCullough, St. Louis. 
Um, my question concerns partnerships also, um, and I wanted to um, know in relationship to this conversation about we and belonging, the partnership with uh, between Opera Theater and Jazz St. Louis, um, if you would perhaps talk about that a little bit. And then this new idea of balance uh, is in interesting as well, as, as for how that worked and if it worked, yeah. Uh, I'll take that question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Diane, thank you. Uh, I think Diane's referring to uh, a, a partnership that began with the opera that we produced by Terence Blanchard uh, called Champion, a world premiere opera in jazz. Uh, that was a, uh, a co-commission between Jazz St. Louis and Opera Theater of St. Louis. Uh, and the partnership will continue next year because we, we co-commissioned uh, Terence's second opera called The Fire Shut Up in My Bones, which um, he's writing furiously as we speak. Uh, and uh, I, well, I guess I, Gene Dubs Radford, who's executive director of Jazz St. Louis, isn't here to uh, say what he thinks of the partnership, but I, I think Gene would say uh, mm -hmm. that we've had a great partnership uh, for all these years. The idea of commissioning Terrence was Gene's idea. Uh, the, the meeting was a meeting of Jim Robinson, our artistic director, and, and me and Gene Dubs Bradford. And it was literally like the first week I was the general director of Opera Theater, we had this meeting. And uh, there had been this idea bumping around about doing a, a jazz opera that would be uh, an outreach project. Uh, and Jim Robinson said, well, why don't we, if we're going to commission a, a jazz opera, let, let's, let's put it on the uh, subscription as you know, our season. And he said to Gene, if we were to do that, who would be the greatest jazz composer that we could possibly get uh, to do this? And Gene said, Terrence Blanchard. Uh, and Jim said, do you know Terrence Blanchard? Uh, and Gene said, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it was, that was a, a moment that, um, you know, we, we never, uh, I, I never would have thought to commission Terrence Blanchard. Then I went and bought some of his albums. Uh, it was long enough ago that you bought albums. They were physical <laughs> things. Uh, and, um, and I thought, I, I can see exactly why this would be a great choice for an opera composer. Um, Anyway, so, uh, and actually, I think quite significantly, uh, the funding f came uh, from Jazz St. Louis. In other words, we both put money in it together, but a funder gave each of us money mm -hmm, to, mm -hmm. to put into the project. Uh, and, and I think that was important from the beginning. Which is interesting, though, but uh, Opera Theater is quite, much, quite larger yes. than Jazz St. Louis. And how did you navigate the power dynamics? Obviously, they knew a lot more about jazz than you did. That's right. right? And, <laughs> and, and so actually, yeah, the, and I mean, we could talk about this for a long time, but the, the, like how an opera company commissions a work and, and what an opera company is used to getting from a composer, like on mm -hmm. a timetable and whatnot, mm -hmm. is very different from what a jazz uh, producer is used to getting. And so we had moments <laughs> where uh, our organization thought, w we, this project will never come to fruition. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll never, we're going to have to shut it down. It's not going to happen. And Gene Dobbs Redford was a very useful uh, piece of perspective. He was like, oh, no, no, this is fine. You're going to be fine. It's, it's going to work out. <laughs> right. uh, and uh, I, I will say that one thing that I have, and I think, Felicia, I, I learned a lot, actually. I had a, Felicia's convened a lot of important conversations in St. Louis, and I, I've been to some of these where I've learned a lot mm -hmm. about how these partnerships look from mm -hmm. uh, different perspectives. And sometimes learning is painful. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, what you said about the power dynamics, I think, is very important. Uh, a thing that I've always tried to do in co-productions, partnerships of any kind, is right at the upfront, mm -hmm. I say something like, this is my blanket apology in advance <laughs> mm -hmm. for whatever we <laughs> screw up during the, the course of this uh, collaboration. Yeah. Uh, because when two organizations work together, even two equally sized opera companies, mm -hmm. there's just this easy tendency to be like, oh, well, it's those other bad people that did this <laughs> thing that are now creating this problem for us. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I think it's important going into these relationships to say, whatever happens, mm -hmm. let's agree that we're going to work together. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. Gene Dobbs Radford and I had that conversation way at the front. And I said, Gene, whatever we screw up, mm -hmm. just please know that I'm sorry now. Uh, and, and then we did have bumps in the road. There, mm -hmm. there were times where we forgot to call Gene about something because we were the bigger organization See? forging ahead and, and mm -hmm. doing it, you know. Mm -hmm. and, um, 
and, and I, I remember one time Gene called me and he said, I think you may have forgotten to call me about this. <laughs> uh, and I was like, Gene, I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. Will you please forgive me? Mm -hmm. And then we went right on. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, um, I mean, that's a personal relationship that you have to earn. Mm -hmm. So uh, that gentleman there and then, uh, oh, then up here, I want to make sure I, I see somebody from over there. But go ahead, sir. Uh, and then hello, is this working? Yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm Brayden Tone. I'm a conductor. Uh, most of <laughs> this very complicated issue seems to come with very complicated answers. Um, but when Mark was talking about belonging, especially you know when you come to an opera or into any cultural situation where you feel like you are the person who maybe shouldn't actually be there. But here we are at these opera performances. What would it take when you get the uh, taped message at the beginning reminding you to turn off your cell phone? <laughs> and then it said, and would everyone please turn and introduce themselves to the people sitting on either <laughs> side of you, like in church. front of it's you, called and mass. behind you. It's called church. church, it's church. church. Or, or uh, you know, as a conductor, I go to, I conduct many performances where the general director will come out and make a speech, acknowledging all of the donors. Why can't we include saying, now, everyone, please say hello to the people you don't know sitting nearest to you, because yeah. this really would reset the whole paradigm of coming to an opera performance where the, the tendency is to think you come in, you, you behave in a very reserved manner, and sit down and don't speak to anyone. Mm -hmm. And so if we actually, if, if suddenly people went, oh my gosh, someone wants me to behave differently than I do every time I come to this, the word would get out because someone would say, the strangest thing happened to me when I went to this opera. They actually wanted us to meet the people next to us. And that really might go somewhere in changing the, mm -hmm. the conceived notion of, of mm -hmm. what it is to attend an opera performance. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Great idea. <laughs> so in the very first row here, uh, can we have the mic down here in the first row? <laughs> uh, we have uh, Huang Rao, who would just like to ask a quick question. Oh, I'm going to let him cut the mic. Composer. I'm sorry to be the interrupter oh. here. Uh, I just prefer to sit here and listen. You guys did a great job talking about the subject. Uh, I just want to share one thought. Is, um, since you talk about the e pluribus unum, and I just want to share my thought on that part since we talk about it. To us, this opera doesn't provide answers. If you come to see our opera to look for answer, we want to give you questions. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. We want to evoke question. We want to evoke conversation. We want to have you to, to ask those questions and seek your own answer. Mm -hmm. And this moment, um, we, we, we want to show that uh, different people come. They see this moment. I take out all the orchestra, by the way. It's a cappella. Because I want to make this moment to be surreal to be not necessary as a conclusion of the opera. Actually, it's an inserted moment that uh, to reflect whoever you are, whatever background you came from, and whatever experience and journey you took and will take, when you hear this moment, you ask questions. And I thank you for your question and many other questions uh, asked from people. Different people feel it differently. Some feel it as a as an aspirational, some feel is that's not real. Some feel uh, this is never happened, never could achieve. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we want, to ask questions, to, to examine where we are. Uh, last night, when I was watching the performance, I, I cried at that moment because I thought of what happened in our southern border yes. mm -hmm. with children taken away. When I was thinking about that, and I, I was looking at the words, listening to the music, I was telling myself, my God, we are so far away from that. Yeah. And again, that's not wrong. And I will not change that. Because in, in 20 years, in 50 years, I hope one day we look back to this opera. Oh my God, that's like fair tale. How could things like, uh, uh, this is so real. How could things at that day happen the, the opposite? And maybe, I don't know, but maybe we never achieve that. But this is what I call a mirror a mirror to people, whatever background we came from, and whatever age we will live in. We listen to this chorus, and we examine who we are, 
and where we are. And that's all I want to say. Thank you. Yeah. Bravo. Thank you. Wait, I, I just want to say, this is the hazard of having living composers. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Huang Ro, thank you. That's incredible. Thank you. It's the joy of <laughs> having living composers. Um, I'm Patricia Rice, <clears throat> and I'm from St. Louis. Last night at E Pluribus Unum, we did see a, mo a, a mirror. A real effort was made for a variety of faces, cultural differences in that piece. And uh, the, the casting was very carefully reflective of the culture from which the, the, the cast come from. However, that's not true most of the time. Two week, three weeks ago, 11,000 people attending the Municipal Opera, which started as opera and now is more Broadway. It's a very famous, very, very fine theater. They did <clears throat> uh, Jerome Robbins Broadway, a dance patchwork of his best work. And one of them was the, the Thai dancers from King and I. It was exquisite, the costumes were fabulous, but they used the dancers, they chose from the 60, 65 dancers, uh, fabulous dancers, and they, so they, they weren't Thai. There was a protest during the first week of the 100th anniversary and unfortunately, in my opinion, the protest came during the performance. They screamed, yellow face, yellow face, yellow face, and not you know, at the box office or outside. Some people would say, well, maybe you couldn't cast that. And certainly, if you think of the Pearl Fishers, which the Met did a few years ago, and we've done here, um, you'd say, can you even cast that? It was certainly at the chorus level. We have a very famous parade on uh, July the 4th called the VP Parade. It's had a Chinese dragon forever. They, they, because they go in and out and in and out, they, they run four times the length of the parade. It's usually 90 degrees. You need marathon runners. If they won't have one this year because they couldn't find really more than one Chinese person to do it. What, what do you think about casting, and how important is that to opera? There is a session at 2.45 this afternoon to 3.45 <laughs> called Culturally Conscious Casting. It's in Regency A. So <laughs> it's a very important topic and um, worthy of the hour to discuss it, but it's a, yeah, have some lunch and come at 2.45, Regency A. <laughs> well, no, but the, I'll just say briefly, there are no easy answers, answers to these yeah. dilemmas. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the question of, are we going to be able to keep doing The King mm -hmm. and I, or Madame mm -hmm. Butterfly, or you know, all these other pieces, as our context keeps changing, is an important one. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we're just going to have to keep navigating through as a, as a field. OK, any questions from this side of the room? Because I've been looking this way, sight lines. <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> Thank you, everyone who advocated for me. Uh, <laughs> uh, I had a question. I wanted to um, kind of connect this back to the beginning conversation that you all had in regard to trauma and also looking at. Uh, how we start to address these issues internally within our organizations. One of the things that I was really affected by both emotionally and physically in the opera last night was the racial Thursday scene. Uh, and as I was processing that for myself, I wondered if uh, Opera Theater of St. Louis had done any work with the artists who were working on the opera, the staff who were working in support of the opera, mm -hmm. to discuss it, work through it, mm -hmm. um, you know, if there was any trauma that some of those uh, folks were experiencing. If so, what was the impact of that? And if not, what could be the potential impact of that for not just the individual, but for the organization and the art form? Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, I will say I wasn't in the rehearsal room. Our, our stage director, Matthew Ozawa, uh, is um, a, a very gifted person and uh, a young person. He's a, I think he's a millennial, right? And mm -hmm. so he, uh, he, he brought to this uh, process an incredible sense of that responsibility for uh, working with the performers uh, in a way that was going to uh, keep everybody feeling uh, safe. And uh, I know he, he put an enormous amount of time and thought into how to structure those rehearsals. Uh, and, and so that, I mean, the, the, there's a the, uh, very disturbing rape scene as well, and, and the performers involved had to really work out how to understand how to treat each other during the rehearsals and the performances. Uh, so that uh, they would do their job, but uh, but be safe as human beings. Uh, so this is the, I, I can't I don't know if anybody is here from the production of the cast who can speak in more detail to how it was handled. Uh, I know that I'll say one other thing about it, which is that uh, originally uh, Jim Robinson, our artistic director, was going to direct an American Soldier, and as we got uh, closer to the uh, go point, Jim really thought, you know, I, I don't think as a, as a white guy I should direct this opera. Mm -hmm. uh, and Matthew Ozawa is a director that we had worked with uh, at our company in earlier capacities, and he's a rising star, and Jim thought this is the perfect chance for Matthew, who brings a, a very important point of view as an Asian American, to uh, direct this opera and make his debut as a uh, director of a main stage production for us. Uh, and of course, the, the competency that Matthew brought to the process uh, was invaluable to it. Uh, so Jim, I, I think this was a good decision. Jim was co-director and dramaturg, brought the, his enormous experience to the project, but sort of gave the driver's seat uh, to another director. Uh, we're sort of coming to the end of this period of time, so I'm going to uh, ask you guys to, if you have any closing kind of remarks, and I just want to sort of ap applaud you all for the work you do in undoing racism, all from our various different little platforms of experiences, and I just want to thank you for that. I don't think I really have more to say, to, unless you have some closing comments you want to share to, to our, 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 our colleagues here today. today. I think I, I will say just a couple words that this feels to me like a very special moment in our history, as painful as it is every day, to turn on the television, open up a newspaper, look at my Twitter feed, whatever it is, and this barrage of of consternation and despair about where we are as a country. At the same time, because I'm an, an optimist, I feel so inclined to want to seize this moment. Uh, we have not had permission to be as transparent and open about things like racism, to actually say racial equity and say uh, racism and talk about segregation in our history. And so I, I am uh, inspired and, and also, I feel so blessed to be supported by a, a great board of directors uh, at the Regional Arts Commission and a tremendous arts and cultural community that is all in right now uh, on this issue. And it's, it's just great to be in St. Louis. If you don't live here, you should be living here. You should be living here. <laughs> well, um, let's give a round of applause for our, uh, our panelists. and. and Thank you, guys. This is hard work.